Hi, welcome to Prodi Valley Church at home. I'm Brent, I'm one of the pastors here at Prodi Valley Church. It's great to have you joining our online teaching. We do believe though that for the church to be the church, it really means gathered community and connection to others. If you're visiting, I'd love you to scan the QR code that is on screen right now, and it'll help us to connect you into one of those midweek communities where you can be nurtured, prayed with and prayed for, and where you can be sent out into your neighborhood, into your workspace to make a difference for Jesus' sake. Secondly, we'd love to plug you into one of our serving opportunities. There are just countless spaces in the life, work and ministry in the church and out from the church into the broader community. And we'd love to take what you have been given by God and somehow leverage it to make Jesus' name known amongst the nations. And so we'd love you to connect with us in those ways. If you want any further information, do plug into our online platforms. Uh, our website, proteavalleychurch.org, has all the information you could need and you can connect to us from there. We're going to head straight into last Sunday's online teaching and so let me pray. Father and Son and Spirit, thank you so much for the gift of your great love for us that was exhibited by you creating us, molding us and shaping us in the image of God. Thank you too, Jesus, that you exhibited love for us when you died for us in our place on the cross and that you have allowed us to have the promise of eternal life. But until the day arrives when we are gifted that final gift of eternal life, Lord, we want to be found about the stuff of your kingdom, seeing your kingdom come here on earth. And so may this time of teaching equip us and train us and make us useful for you. And so we ask your blessing now and we ask this in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. And this morning, Holy Spirit, I pray that you will meet each one of us individually where we are at. Prepare our hearts for your message. Make it good soil that we will grow to become more and more like you and so that we will see more of your power of the Holy Spirit in our lives every single day. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's be seated. So we're going to do the um, scripture reading and I'm going to ask Monique to, to read for us, please. You can open your Bibles. Um, we're reading from Nehemiah 8, and it will be on the screen as well. All the people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the scribe, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord has commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. Then Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is sacred to our Lord. Do not grieve for the Lord is your strength. 
You may wonder why we left out some of the verses, because they have a whole long list of very difficult to pronounce names, and I thought it would be easier to save Monique from doing that. Uh, Liesl, your Afrikaans song was great, by the way, thank you so much. I did see that it changed your pronunciation of Nehemiah to Nimia, um, but that's, that's the way these things go. Let's pray, and then I'm going to teach you God's Word this morning. Father, thanks. Um, so thanks for the beauty of your people, Lord, uh, across all generations who have experienced your love, who have found their lives just transformed by you, and we pray that the same thing would happen in this space this morning. And so, Lord, would you be manifest in this space? Would you give us uh, ears to hear, but not just to hear, but to really listen and to absorb your word? May it change us and transform us so that when we walk out of this place, Jesus, we look a little bit more like you, and would you continue that transformation until we get to see you face to face one day? You began a good work in us, Lord, and would you carry it on? To completion. And we know, Lord, that we are going to stumble, we are going to get confused, we are going to get things wrong, but you're a God who is gracious and compassionate and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And so thank you, Lord, that even when we fail, that your love is sufficient and it covers a multitude of sins. So may you have your way with us this morning, Lord. In our words, uh, may they be faithful to Scripture and to what you would want to teach us. And so help us, Lord, to really listen to your voice ultimately. Not that it's me speaking, but that you would somehow be speaking through me. And so we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. So the Middle East has been like a politically explosive place across almost all of human history. Um, there is this great line about the Islamic nation in the scriptures uh, where Ishmael goes off. It says he will be a wild donkey of a man and will kind of be, always be at odds with people. And we have seen that in the Middle East. And so you have these factions on the left and on the right fighting. And there were just constant wars, constant battles. We as a church went to go support Syrian refugees who had come out of the war in Syria. We were in a little town called Mafrak, just inside uh, Jordan, about five kilometers uh, from the, the border. And in fact, on the one trip we took, we could actually hear the bombs falling on the border post as we arrived. And it was just, it was just an amazing experience to see the reality of war, I guess, close up up front. We saw video images that these families would show us of Aleppo, which was their, one of their hometowns, which was this beautiful city, and it was just bombed out, walls destroyed, everything that was good broken. And now they found themselves in this foreign place, and there was all sorts of complexities of working in another nation as a refugee. And if you read through the Old Testament scriptures, this is in fact the story of much of Israel's history. So in about 1200 BC, they find themselves in Egypt. They lived there for 400 years. There were all sorts of cultural pressures on them, all sorts of uh, ideologies, all sorts of images of false gods that are impressed upon them. And you can just imagine uh, the pressure that there was to conform to that way of life. They come back in dribs and drabs back to, uh, back to Jerusalem and back to Israel. And then in 586, they're taken into exile into Babylon and they spend 130 years in Babylon. This is about four generations of people. So like the last family that lived in Jerusalem was like your great, great, great granddaddy and grandma, and all this history is now being eroded away, and again in Babylon, just all these fantastic images of false gods, there was the worship of Nebuchadnezzar, the king himself, and so the people of God have all of these other voices pressing in on them to believe other things, and then under Nehemiah and Ezra, they find their way finally back into the promised land, back to Jerusalem, back to home base. But so much of what held them together as a people, so much of what was important to them as a culture had been lost and had to be rediscovered. And so into the midst of this, Nehemiah, not a religious guy, but a faithful guy. He wasn't a priest or anything. He, in fact, worked in catering in, uh, in the king's uh, house. He was a cupbearer to the king. He is the guy that says, we've got to go home. We've got to get our people back. He is the one who engages with the king and finally brings God's people back. But where we cut into the story now, after 130 years of being away from home, the people are back in the promised land, back in their city, back in the place where they worshiped God, and they come to Ezra, and it's now his moment. Like, you're the guy that's been trained up in all of this. We want to hear God's word preached to us. And what I love about these passages of Scripture is we read them, and I mean, so you heard Monique read it to you. Great job. Thank you, Monique. 
And I love the way you're all sitting like lying slouched. We'll, give, we'll forgive you. It's like 40 degrees Celsius, okay? But you're like lying slouched in your chairs. When, when Ezra stands up and opens the scroll, because it wasn't a book, it would have been a scroll, and it would have contained probably the first five books, the Pentateuch of the Old Testament. He stands up and opens this on a platform above the people. Do you read what happens? Everybody stands. And then the next thing, they're face down, worshiping God, going, amen, amen. And we're just like, yeah, read the word to us, man. Give it to us, Monique. And, and and maybe we should have a little bit more respect. So when, when I first entered the ministry, I was at Belleville Church, and we had this thing where we would have the Bible, a big, like a massive big tome of a Bible, and the elders would walk out on a Sunday morning, and somebody would, would step out before the Bible came out and say, please stand, and everybody would rise up, and then the Bible would be paraded down the aisle up to the front, and would be laid on the communion table. And maybe, maybe we need to do something like that again, because... It seems to me we take God's word quite lightly. And so today I want to talk a little bit about the beauty of God's word and the power of God's word. And and I I guess one of my prayers for you is that you would that you would take God's word a lot more seriously. And so could I maybe just really put a challenge in front of you? So this is how most of us read our Bibles, and I'm not no judgment here, okay? Because this is how Brent reads his Bible. It's in bed on a phone on a Bible app, right? That that's how most of us do this. And I think there's, there's a beauty about that. There, there, is, there is something beautiful about falling asleep whilst reading God's word or praying to God. There is something of God's father heart in that for us. So I'm not dissing you if that's the way he'd do it, but maybe for the next week or two, how about every time you read scripture, you stood up and then opened your Bible and try and get a physical Bible and then, and then just put it on the counter and then get on your hands and knees for a moment and just worship God for, for a moment or two and then stand up and read Scripture standing. Just almost, you know, my kids are going to school now at, at the Denville High School and they're trying to teach the kids good manners. So when a girl comes in, you, like, you step away from the door and you let the girl in first. And if you're sitting down and the teacher walks in, you stand up. Like, how, about we, how about for the next while, we just try and stand up to show some reverence and respect for the Word of God. There's something beautiful about the Scriptures, something powerful about the Scriptures. I think God uses the Scriptures to shift and to change our lives. And, and perhaps we just need to take it a little more seriously. So Ezra begins to read this. They bow down, amen, amen. And then he reads, this is, like, what's the longest sermon you've ever listened to? Okay, I know my longest one is 52 minutes and something seconds. I can't remember. It was many, many years ago. People were like that, said no one's coming back next Sunday. But people kept coming back. In fact, it's one of the things that grew the church, and it's no glory to me. It was about Jesus. We just preached Jesus for months on end. Like, who is he? What has he done? What has he accomplished on our behalf? And it was long. It was meaty. And people just kept coming back because I think there's a hunger in us to know who Jesus is. Ezra preaches from daybreak until noon, okay, six hours. So we've got, a, we've got a couple of hours to go, so buckle down. Some other guys will come in at 10 o'clock. We, should we do this? I don't know that I could do it in this heat, but there's something about the law that so is compelling to them that they sit there with rapt attention, listening to what Ezra is teaching to them. And then at the end of it all, they're weeping because they realize what they have lost. They have forgotten who this God is. There are rhythms of life and festivals that they're called to celebrate and ways of worshiping that they have lost for five generations whilst they've been stuck in Babylon. And now they're rediscovering all of who God is, all of what God expects of them. on one hand, they're cut to the heart, very much like Acts chapter 2 when Peter preaches at Pentecost. Like They're just broken because we've drifted so far from where God has wanted us to be. So when Ezra reads it, it's the first five books we think. It's not clear, but it says the, the, the law of Moses. We generally think it's the first five books written by Moses of the New Testament. It would have given them the basics of life, all of the various festivals that they were to uphold, the particular way that they would offer various sacrifices to God, to reconnect to God, to atone for their sins. It was all these rhythms of life. Now for us, as modern Christians, we don't read much of the Old Testament. In fact, most of us, I think, camp down in the New Testament for the most part. Uh, one of the things that I've been doing over the last three weeks is reading out of the lectionary. Um, so if you weren't here over the last three weeks, let me just help you out. The lectionary is a book of readings, runs over a three-year cycle. The Anglicans use it a lot. So if you, if you come, come from an Anglican church, the lectionary reading would be read in every Anglican church around the world on that Sunday. And it forces preachers to get to different parts of the scriptures. And so when I came back from leave, I thought it'd be a great idea to find my rhythm again, forces me to get out of my own comfort zones. And so Nehemiah and then the last couple of weeks, Corinthians and the week before that, I can't remember the 
first one was, uh, I've been forced to get just be pressed into preaching something that was not on my mind, but I think we have to trust that God works through the history of his church. So we, we as Christians, we don't want to just come down in the New Testament. We want, to, we want to take seriously both the Old and the New Testaments. So Jesus, the only Bible Jesus would have read was the Old Testament. Everything we have in the New Testament was written post-Jesus, in fact, post-resurrection, most of it written by Paul and some of the other followers. The Bible Jesus would have known would have been the Old Testament scriptures, which we don't read that much. And at one point, on the road to Emmaus, he runs into two disciples. This is after his resurrection. He hides himself from them, so he's got some cloak on or something, and they don't recognize who he is. And they're having this long debate as they walk to this little town of Emmaus. And they don't recognize who he is. And they say, like, have you not heard what's happened? Like this guy we followed, he's died. He was crucified by the Romans. But there have been some reports and we're not really sure what happened because the guys are saying that he actually is alive and we've, we're, like, we're confused and we're waiting for more information. And Jesus, it says there that Jesus began to explain all that the scriptures taught about him. And so if we are not going to spend time in all of the scriptures, we're going to miss out on something of the beauty of who Jesus is. There is so much richness in the Old Testament that will help you understand who he is. So Timothy says this, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So if we're going to be well-taught, well-rebuked, and if we're going to have our behavior corrected, we're going to be trained up in righteousness, then you need to have a staple diet of both Old and New Testaments. You need to be getting a little bit of everything. So do you remember, I don't remember it well, but do you, do you remember the older people, kids won't remember this at all, but if you're in your 40s, do you remember the, the great famine in Ethiopia in the 80s? It was sort of 83 to 86, I think, were the dates, give or take. I remember these horrific images. I remember being so moved by them as a kid of these children on TV with these just spindly little arms and legs, but these massive bloated bellies. Do you recall that? So it's a condition called kwashioko, and, and the problem is not a lack of calories, it's not, it's not, there's not enough food, it's, there's not enough good food. And so there was not enough intake of proteins and of vitamins and minerals, which causes this massive retention of water. There was enough calories to go around, it was just junk calories. It was just all carbohydrates. And the reality is I think many of us as Christians are a little bit like those Ethiopian kids. We've got these spindly little arms and legs and these bloated bellies because we're only camping down in one part of the scriptures. But there is a beauty about who Jesus is that you will only find if you read the Old Testament scriptures. So you go back into Exodus and you read the story about how God says to the people of God, I want you to take a lamb, I want you to slaughter it, I want you to sprinkle the blood on the doorposts of your homes so that when the angel of death flies over, you will not be touched. And in the homes where there's no blood, those families will be cursed and affected by death. And then you realize when the Bible talks about Jesus being the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that's what John the Baptizer says, you'll go, oh, no way, that's where it comes from. Like, he's the Lamb who sacrificed. And the blood is not sprinkled on my home, it's sprinkled on my heart. And so I will not be touched by death. And, and, and so there's all this richness of imagery. In the Bible, it says that Jesus is my high priest in Hebrews, okay? So like, what does that mean? Well, then you go back to Leviticus. Leviticus, and you realize that the high priest stood between the people and a holy God and interceded on their behalf. Like, 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 I know, God, that you should crush this people. You should destroy them because they've been sinful and stupid and foolish. Oh, by the way, go read that through the Old Testament. If you ever think people are good, go read the Old Testament. It'll help you understand a whole bunch of things about you. And, and, and so the priest would stand before God and go, just have mercy on them, have mercy on them. And then we realize that's what Jesus does for us all the time, stands before the Father and says, the Price has been paid. And so we need to be getting into all the scriptures because, and this is what he says to the guys in Emma, on the road to Emmaus, beginning with Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them that all that was said in all the scriptures concerning him, the entire scripture from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation is God saying, this is who I am. And this people are rediscovering that. And my contention is that if we do not spend time in the scriptures, and not just a little three-second slot at the start of every day, but maybe, maybe you need to do what Ezra did, like wake up one morning and read from sunrise until 12 and see what God reveals to you about the beauty of who he is. And maybe at the end of that, like these people, you will find yourself weeping, not only about your sinfulness, but about the goodness of God, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The more you read the Old Testament, the more you will marvel at who Jesus is. 
But without scripture, we're gonna have an anemic view of Jesus. Your, your view of Jesus is gonna be thin. You know when you go to a dinner party and then you land up at some, these dinner parties, you always land up at some guy next to you who you don't know and you have some sort of like fairly arbitrary conversation that evening and you go home but you realize you only asked about his job perhaps and he told you that he was a doctor, let's say, and he tells you about what he does. You go, oh, you're a specialist. Like, tell me about what, what does a day look like and you ask him all these things. But then you get home and you realize you didn't ask him about his family. You didn't ask him about what hobbies he does. You just didn't really engage about anything meaningful of his life. I, I think that's the danger for us. Like we, we have a view of Jesus that's it's just thin. It's transparent. It's not, it's not the wonder of him. It's not the depth of who he is. There's this, there's this line in the scriptures where Jesus says of a woman who came to wash his feet, the one who has been forgiven much loves much. And I think when you read the scriptures, you will realize how sinful the human being actually is. And you will realize with what kind of love Jesus has loved you and you will just love him more. And that's the point of the scriptures and we need to get into them. So I, I hear some of you asking the question and I think it's a really valid question. Sure, Brent, I hear you. Okay, I understand you. I totally I agree with you. I should be spending way more time in the Old Testament and I know I should be reading much more of my Bible, not just the little devotional that I read every uh, Monday morning, you know, or every couple of days. I, I know this, but I, I don't know how to understand the scriptures. Like I read them and I'm just like, it, like I, it's dense to me. I can't, I can't get into it. Like, like I read some of these sections in Leviticus about slaughtering of animals and I don't know what I must do. And you know, Fido looks across the room at me and he gets quite nervous when I read Leviticus because like, he's not sure how this is gonna end for him. Like what do I do here? And, and then I read some of the New Testament stuff like Paul's writings. Paul writes many of the New Testament letters and the writing is dense. I mean, he's the longest sentences. Like he has, he has one paragraph that is an entire sentence for like 16 lines. Like dude, do you not breathe when you're writing these things? And you read it and you like, I don't know what he said. I go back to the beginning and you, okay, so you're, you're raising questions that have been raised since the very beginning. Peter writes about Paul. He says his letters contain some things that are hard to understand. So if you ever wanted to be in good company, you with Peter, the rock on whom I shall build this church is you, Peter. Like, I don't understand Paul. Like the oak is like really confusing sometimes. And I think that's an okay space to be. But there is something important here that we do well to note. And... I think we get this wrong sometimes. You're all here, so good job to you guys. Hallelujah, praise Jesus, right? They need competent and qualified Bible teachers to help them understand the scriptures. So in verse seven and eight, the Levites, these guys have been trained up their whole lives and they were historically, this tribe out of the nation of Israel, one of the 12 tribes, they were historically the priests. So like your daddy was a priest and your granddaddy was a priest and his daddy before him was a priest. Like this heritage of me passed down. This was like baked into your blood, literally from generation to generation to generation. So the Levites instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. So they read from the book. We had that. Thank you, Monique. Okay. They read from the book of the law of God. They then, hopefully what I'm doing, they made it clear and gave the meaning so the people actually understood what was being read. So one of the things that happened in the 1500s was that Gutenberg invented the printing press. I'm sure you've all heard about this amazing invention, although we no longer use paper books, but there was this press that he invented that meant everybody could have a Bible. Up until that point, you would only have a Bible if you were a king or if you were very religious and very wealthy because the, the Bible would have been handwritten. So there are these ancient copies, literally hand-scribed out. So Gutenberg invents the printing press, and what happens is Bibles are everywhere all of a sudden. And then not only are they everywhere all of a sudden, they get translated into all the languages. And so no longer do you have to read the Bible in Latin, but now you can read it in your mother language. German and English, and there is a great blessing in that. There is something beautiful that every person can have in their hands a copy of the Word of God in their home language. And I can't remember how many languages the Bible has been translated into at the moment. Maybe somebody here can tell me, but it's, it's hundreds. And not only languages, even down to little dialects because there's different nuances of language. And I think it's an amazing thing. So I can open my Bible on my phone and I can have access to not only different versions of the Bible in different languages, but different translations even even in the English. So like you can read the old King James, thou shalt not, and then you can read the message, hey man, you really shouldn't. You know, much more common language. And so you can read it in all sorts of different translations. But this, this becomes a complexity as well. 
the danger that comes with that is that every person who opens the Bible then thinks that they can also translate the Bible well. And unfortunately, in my experience, so often people will come to Grant and myself and they will say, I've been reading something in the Bible and here's what I believe it says to me. And I've got to go, I, actually, I don't think that's what it says at all. And invariably in my experience is when scripture is misread, it's misread to justify a position that is untenable. And they distort the scriptures because they don't want the Bible to say what it actually plainly says. Because if they read what it plainly says, they're gonna have to change their behavior or believe different things. So, for example, the history of this country was marred by theologians who took the Bible and said that certain race and culture groups were less human than others, less important than others. And they had to distort the scriptures in the most bizarre ways to uphold that truth. And it's gonna take us generations to undo the damage that was done in this nation. And yet I think we do this at our own personal level all the time. Sometimes you misread it because you're, you're not that sharp and that's okay. But my suspicion is that oftentimes it's evil working hand in hand with our arrogant and self-righteous hearts. So Tim Keller is a, a talk that he did at a conference a couple of years ago. Um, so maybe let me tell people the word here. So you, have you heard the word exposition? So exposition is to expose the meaning of the scriptures. That's what it is. So hopefully this is what you're getting this morning, exposition of the scriptures. I'm trying to help you unpack Nehemiah 8. He wrote, he did a talk, a 40-minute talk called Satanic Exposition. Like that's got to make you slow down for a moment. Like we need godly, competent, trained people to help us understand that the word of God needs to be interpreted correctly. I've heard so many strange interpretations from so many people, and not just lay people. So Grant and I were having a chat before the service. I don't know what to do here. You're gonna have to help me out for a moment. Do I name names or do I not name names? Because part of me does not like, I, I just think there's a place where you don't wanna be saying, you know, that oak's junk and that oak's junk and that oak's junk. But there's a tension in me that I think sometimes we go down to the bookstore and we want to buy a book because we want to develop our faith. We want to know Jesus better. We want to understand the wonder of who he is. And so we go down to one of the bookstores that has a whole bunch of Christian books and there are just reams and reams and reams of them and we have no idea how to choose. And the problem is that when I go down, like a significant portion of those books are poison for your soul. Because what the teachers are teaching is not biblical doctrine. Oh, they quote the Bible. Because this is what I hear people say to me all the time. Oh, I listen to him, but he quotes the Bible all the time. Yes, so does the devil. Go look at when Jesus is tempted. Remember when Jesus is tempted by the devil after having fasted for 40 days? The devil quotes scripture to him every single time. Do not believe that because somebody quotes the Bible, they're teaching well. And I don't know whether to name names, but like, here's what I would say to you. If the guy has a TV show, do not listen to him. If the guy has a private jet, do not listen to him. For the Lord whom we worship did not even have a place to lay his head. Foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man does not even have a place to lay his head. And if somebody is amassing wealth in Jesus' name, that person is not about Jesus' business. That person is doing satanic exposition of the Scriptures to justify their own wealth. And invariably, those people, those kind of preachers, are preying on the poor and the marginalized and the desperate. You want to see the prosperity teaching that happens in Africa. Every street corner has some church and the basic message is Jesus wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and happy. And if you do not have those three things, you have not been blessed of God. And that means that most of Africa is not blessed of God. And I do not believe that. For I can have nothing and count myself blessed of God. Go read the scriptures. Read the scriptures. Let scripture interpret scripture. Do not let your heart interpret scripture. And pull yourself under good, godly, biblical preaching. So Ezra and the Levites, they explain God's word to the people. These guys are trained for years. Peter does the same thing at Pentecost. You can go read it in Acts chapter 2. Three years he interned with Jesus. Like that's a pretty good internship, right? I reckon you, like, you know your stuff if you've walked with Jesus for three years every day and then he preaches at Pentecost. 3,000 people get saved on the day. Um, Paul does this in Acts 20. Godly man trained up under Gamaliel, the greatest of the Jewish teachers of his day. And then he gets touched by the Spirit of God and he teaches so well. People come to listen to him 
all night long. In fact, the one night he's preaching for so long, some dude falls asleep and falls out of the window and dies. They have to pray him back to life and Paul carries on teaching. Like this is legend stuff. Like you guys, like an hour on a Sunday morning, we're gonna work at this deal. Grant, come on man, next Sunday, hey, be preaching three hours, buddy, you're it. Preaching and explanation by trained teachers is a normal and powerfully important part of the life of Jesus' church. And I will guarantee you that the person who only has their own scriptures and only reads it on their own and tries to interpret it on their own will find themselves believing things about Jesus that are not true. You need to study your scriptures, but do not do it in isolation. Draw around yourself godly people who will help you interpret the scriptures and apply them to your lives. You're here, good job. You're coming under godly preaching. Grant and I work really hard to to make sure that our sermons are solid, that they are biblical. We will crit each other. We will make sure that we're preaching to you in the best way possible what we believe is the word of God. And we will get this wrong sometimes. And you get to call us out on that. So on one hand, Hebrews tells us, Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give account. And we take it really seriously. We do not take preaching lightly, okay? But on the other hand, you need to be like the Bereans. This is an act. The Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica for they received the message with great eagerness and they examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul was saying was true. So Paul's going, well, this is what we believe about Jesus. And they're going, well, that's bizarre. How can we believe that God became flesh? And they go and read the scriptures and then they see the promises out of the Bible that a virgin will be with child and he will be Emmanuel, God with us. And then Paul says, but he's going to die for your sins. And they're like, what do you mean? No, he's the Lamb of God. Well, they go read the Old Testament, the Lamb of God. Wow, this actually does make sense. Use scripture to interpret scripture. Be very careful of people who take one line of scripture out so maybe, I won't mention the name, but one of the major mega churches whose, whose music you listen to all the time, I heard the worst sermon I've ever heard in all my life. So in Acts 26, Paul stands before Agrippa, the king, and he says, and the ESV has got a better translation, so in the ESV he says, I consider myself fortunate, O king, to stand before you today. That's the sentence. I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today. One of the translations, an old English translation says, I think myself happy to stand before you today. And this preacher took the words, I think myself happy, and preached a sermon about you can think yourself happy or you can think yourself sad. Now that is the most ungodly self-help sermon I think I've ever heard. It just batters even the English into a way that God never intended it to be read. And it misses the point of the text entirely. Do not trust everybody with your heart. And the scriptures have the ability to shift your heart. And scriptures, satanically exposed, will have the ability to twist your heart. There is a caution here. So if we have the scriptures and you have competent preachers, what happens? Well, the people in verse 9, they are weeping. Listen to what happens in Acts 2. Peter preaches to them. The people heard this. They were cut to the heart and they said, what must we do? And so let me close with maybe here are the most clear tests of what I think biblical preaching would look like. Two things. If you're looking for biblical preaching, if you're looking for something that's gonna shift your life like it shifted the lives of these Jewish people, every time God's word is spoken to the Jewish people across all of the Old Testament, things shift. Because here's what happens, they they abandon God, they get into trouble, they cry out to God, and God puts his spirit on one of his prophets, and the prophet says, thus saith the Lord, and they return back to God, and then they forget, and then they ignore, and then they distort, and they find themselves far, and then they cry out to God. And And so part of the returning to God is always the scriptures. They call us to respond to Jesus, and these are the two tests. Preaching that does not call you to repent of your sin is not biblical preaching. I mean, you need good advice at a whole bunch of levels. You need some practical help in a whole bunch of places. But at some point, the scriptures call us, stop walking away from God and walk towards him. And so these people are weeping because they realize that they have broken all of God's commands. Because if you go read the first five books of the Bible, by the way, you will find a lot of thou shalt's. All of the 10 important ones are in that section, by the way. And so as Ezra begins to read this on that morning, and by the time they get to 11 o'clock, these guys are like, oh my goodness, like this is so bad. Like I had no idea. Like I had no idea. I've been doing this and I I didn't know. And and like what do I do now? 
And I was taught this nonsense by my dad because clearly he didn't know either. And like, we're in trouble, guys. And then Ezra begins to read about a God who punishes sin. And they're like, like we're in real trouble. Like, like, we have an angry God and we've not done what he commanded us to do. But then they tell the people, this is, and this is so important, the second mark is there is grace in your sin. Stop weeping, guys. This is actually a time for celebration for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, they didn't have the fullness of the gospel. These were, these were hazy promises. But the, the God of the Old Testament, if you watch this, every time Israel calls out to him, God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. So you want to know biblical preaching? You should hear, don't think so highly of yourself. You've actually got a bunch of stuff wrong. And you need to turn from that. For if you don't, there will be judgment but then you must hear the other side of it. There is a God who loves you so deeply, so powerfully that he went to the cross on your behalf, died the death you should have died because he lived the perfect life that you will never get to live out. And if you trust upon him, your sins will be forgiven. And so when the people come in Acts 2 and they're saying to Peter, like, what do we do? Repent and be baptized and you'll be saved. And so those two things are the mark of godly teaching. You, you don't need good advice. You need good news. God has done something for you. That's what the scriptures teach us from the very beginning. It's always God at work. It's always God redeeming. It's always God transforming. It's God who is forgiving. It is God who is lifting up the broken. It is God who is not crushing a broken reed. It is God who's not snuffing out the wick. It's always God at work. You read the New Testament. It's like it's clear as day. God has done something for you. But part of that is you need help. Like he's ready to help you, but, but you're sick. And you need those two things. And if you're not hearing those two things, you're not getting the gospel. You're not getting biblical preaching. And so many of these mega church pastors that I hear, the message is basically you need to be healthy and happy and wealthy. Oh, and by the way, pay me a lot of money so that I can teach you these things. And I don't, I don't see that. In fact, if you read the scriptures at one point, one of the guys comes to the apostles. We see you doing some cool stuff. Can I buy this gift? I want to do the magic too. May you and your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the things of God. You cannot buy what Jesus offers because he gives it to you freely. That is the good news of the gospel. And so you need to hear, I'm not so great and he's everything. I'm empty and he will fill me up. I'm weak, but he is powerful. That is the good news message. And may it make you weep. And then if you are feeling a bit weepy because you realize you're a disaster, I, I, may the joy of the Lord be your strength. Go and celebrate. Have a good meal. Go buy some lacquer meat and just remember that God has loved you in Christ. That's the good news message. Let's pray. Jesus, I get so passionate about these things because you're incredible. As I read through the Bible, I just marvel at how you love people, Jesus. You, you find people that are the epitome of what we would call the low. We, you, you find people that are sinful. It's the prostitutes. It's the tax collectors. It's people who have ignored you. It's people who have hated you and rejected you. And yet, Jesus, you keep calling them to come back for you're a God who is kind and gracious and gentle. You're a God whose love covers a multitude of sins. And there is no sin that you will not forgive. I have no idea what these people sitting before me this morning have done, Lord, but there are probably stories here that would horrify us if they came out. And yet even those things do not surprise you. And even those things you will forgive for you, you nail those things to the cross with you, Jesus. So, Lord, would you help us to get into the scriptures? Thanks that Grant and I get to preach every week. Keep us faithful, Lord. God, our hearts and our minds. Help us to spend time deeply in embedding the scriptures into us and to listening to other good godly teachers who will help us become better and better. But I pray for every man, woman, and child in this place, Lord, that they would spend time in the scriptures, that they would come to worship on Sundays, to sit under godly preaching. Protect them, Lord, from from finding teachers who will teach what their itching ears want to hear. And our ears itch for lots of things, Lord. Protect us from the evil one who would want to put in our path, satanic expositors who would make the scriptures say things that they never say, distort the meaning of your word and turn it into something 
dark and gross and ugly rather than something beautiful and powerful and life transforming. And help us, Lord, as we read through the scriptures, Jesus, help us to have a greater appreciation of who you are and what you have done for us. Help us to remember that you are the living word, not the written word. The written word's important, Jesus, but thank you that it keeps pointing to you, the living word. And thank you that when you come and live in us by the power of the Spirit, the very word of God will be written on our hearts. And so come, Jesus, teach your people about the wonder of who you are. Help us to love you more deeply. But even more than that, Jesus, help us to understand more deeply your love for us. You're the cornerstone of all the scriptures, Lord. You are the center character of all of the Bible. May you be the central character of our lives. We, we confess, Jesus, that we keep putting ourselves into that position. It's always about me and myself and I. And I pray that it would become less and less about me and much more, Jesus, about you. Friends, I hope that was a blessing to you. Again, we'd love you to plug in and connect to us and to be the church rather than just watching church. And so head to our website, www.proteavalleychurch.org, and you will find all of the relevant information there. We'd love to help plug you into a midweek community. We'd love to help you come and gather with us on Sunday mornings. We'd love to help find a space for you to serve. One of the ways that you can start serving right now is to scan the code now for SnapScan. We'd love you to partner with us. Ministry costs money. We fund a whole bunch of international missionaries around the world who are taking the good news to the nations. We have absolutely loads of phenomenal life-transforming local ministries in various places in our neighborhoods, in local townships, uh, through other organizations who we partner with. And we would love you to partner with us and that out of your money, we would see fruit, a harvest for Jesus kingdom. So please do scan that code and partner with us as we seek to see Jesus made famous amongst the nations here and right to the very ends of the earth. I pray that you have a great week worshiping Jesus and now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God who is our heavenly father and the friendship and fellowship of Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Go in peace and serve Jesus this week well. Amen.